And as you grab your seats, let's grab our Bibles together tonight. We're going to be spending our time together in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And what a joy to be with you this evening. I love Southern Seminary and Boyce College. And God set me on the path to ministry I'm on right now because of this place. And I'm so grateful to see you gathered here under the leadership of my close friend, Dustin Bruce. Dustin and I have known, us, known each other for a long time. When he came here to be a PhD student, he was one of my first interns. That I led the enrollment management team here, and him and Whitney are dear friends of our family, and we go way back, and I love seeing the way that God is flourishing the work of this college under his leadership. As Dustin mentioned, I serve at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission with Russell Moore. We've been there for about seven years. We left Southern in order to take up that mantle, and if you're not familiar with what we do at the ERLC, Basically, our mission is to equip you to understand the moral and ethical issues of the day in light of the Bible. So, in other words, how does the gospel apply to everyday life in light of Jesus Christ? And just so that you're aware of it, you can connect with us at our website, ERLC.com, also on Instagram and all the socials if you want to find out more of what we're up to. But in addition to that, uh, we offer internships. And so if you have a heart for public theology, ethics, public policy, understanding what it looks like for theology to intersect with the culture, then we've got a spot for you in Nashville or at our office in Washington, D.C. that you can find more info about on our website because those are incredible opportunities. And who knows? Good things happen to Dustin after he interned with us. Maybe the same will be the case for you in just a couple of years if you join us. Well, let's turn our attention to the text this evening. We're going to be in Philippians 3, beginning in verse 17, if you want to follow along with me. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you in this time, we are praying that you will clear the distractions of the world around us. As finals loom closer, as deadlines for assignments near, as difficulties surround us, our minds and our hearts could be pulled in so many directions. But Lord, we pray that your spirit falls upon us now and meets us here and helps us to follow you more faithfully in the day ahead so that we might walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, back in the fall of 2002, when I was in college, God changed my life. I was a junior at Texas A&M. We got any juniors out in the crowd just by show of hands? All right. And so I was halfway through my school, and I was on a pathway like many of you are right now into the marketplace, training to be a faithful Christian businessman, just like I'd seen in the life of my dad and in my older brothers. But coming into my junior year, I had an encounter with the Lord that changed my life forever. And in a moment, God called me into vocational Christian ministry. And then just a month after that, uh, the Lord introduced me to a woman named Cammie, who I ended up dating and then marrying while we were still in college. And I served in our college ministry in Texas for a couple years before we packed up a U-Haul and headed north up here to Louisville in order to start seminary. And I had spent my time here over the course of seven years working on my MDiv and my PhD, teaching in systematic theology, leading all the enrollment management. But I'll never forget something that happened just before we loaded up to come here to seminary. See, I was very close with our college pastor, the pastor of our church in our college town, Chris Osborne, who has had dozens of people come through his church and head into ministry. And as we met throughout my time at A&M while I was wrestling with this call to ministry, he said something to me that I'll never forget even to this day. He gave me a warning that he said, Philip, don't let your giftings take you where your character can't keep you. And as he sent me on the way to my ministry journey, those words have stuck with me ever since then. You see, every one of us expects to encounter dangers in ministry. Whether you're heading into full-time ministry or you're going to serve in the marketplace, I know each one of you is going to be committed and faithful to a lifetime of ministry, and it will be full of challenges. 
The types of challenges we expect we might encounter are a Judas who might betray us, or a Saul who might persecute us, or a Demas who might abandon us, or a serpent who might deceive us. But what I want us to think about tonight is this. What if the biggest dangers we will face in our ministries are not in the valleys of our setbacks, but in the mountaintops of our successes? See, when we come to a Philippians 3 this evening, he's going to help us think through the fact that one of the biggest threats we will face in our future is ministry success. Paul is writing to the Philippian church, and earlier in chapter 3, as he's moving towards the end of the book, he is declaring to them to strive for the goal, to compete for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, to seek success in the Christian life, but it comes with its own warning. Perhaps in dorm meetings in the past, you've heard sermons about what it might look like to have a successful ministry. But what I want to offer to you this evening from Philippians 3 is how to protect yourself from a successful ministry. Because what we're going to see here, the big idea that Paul is laying out in Philippians 3, is he's offering us three warnings about the dangers of ministry success. And I want you to notice the first one with me back in verse 17. What Paul is showing us is this. Don't let your su- success take you where your character can't keep you. Do You see how he talks about it? He says, brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Now, I love coming back to visit Louisville, and there are so many things I miss about our time here at the seminary. I miss our friends. I miss the churches. I miss the seminary itself. But I'll tell you, there's one thing I don't miss about Louisville, and that's the potholes. And so we, we have the first snow of the year coming right now, right? And that's going to be the start of pothole season. And back when we were in seminary, uh, we were broke just like you are right now. And so my wife and I were uh, newlyweds. We had a kid on the way. I drove a 1990 Buick that had lost its shocks about two decades ago. And every time I would hit a pothole, that thing, you could feel it for days. But have you ever thought about how a pothole forms? What happens is a small crack is created in the pavement. And then liquid seeps into it, and in the right conditions, just like what we have outside, that liquid freezes, and when it freezes, it expands, and it separates the pavement from itself, and over time, that can lead to chipping and separation, and as the the gap widens, more liquid can fill it, expand it further, and chip away over and over and over again. It starts small, but it grows until there comes a point where that road is no longer recognizable or usable. And that's the same thing that can happen in the compromise of our character. It often starts small, almost imperceptible. There is a progressive chipping away that happens with the compromise of character in ministry until one day you look at yourself in the mirror and you almost can't recognize yourself. It's as if you have been rendered unusable for the gospel. But when Paul is speaking here in Philippians 3.17, he is calling us to a different path. Notice what he says there. He says, imitate those who have a character worth following. The way he says it in verse 17 is, join in imitating me. My wife and I are raising four boys at home. It's always a wild time. And I know many of you may not be married or started the family yet, but here's a pro tip for when you do. Try to get it right with the first one. Because however the first one behaves, the oldest behaves, the rest that are going to imitate it. And that can either be for the good and peace of your home or the discord of your home. Because we are all prone towards imitation, and Paul recognizes that. He reminds us that we should imitate those who have a character worth following. But he also comes behind that in verse 17 to tell us that we should become those who have a character worth following. Do you see how he says it there in verse 17? Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Every one of us has our eyes fixed on a model that's going to shape the way that we move towards maturity. I remember in one of my seminary classes here at Southern, in intro to preaching, the professor at the start of the semester asked us to go one by one around the room and answer the question, Who is the preacher that's had the biggest impact on you through their preaching ministry? So take a second and think about that question. How would you answer that? 
Who is the preacher that's had the biggest impact on you through their preaching ministry? And over the course of 25 people in that class, only two of us mentioned someone by name who they actually knew in person. The rest were people they watched on podcasts or watched their videos when they came out each week. And as I reflected back on that, I'm reminded of the fact that one of them has now abandoned his faith. Another of the preachers that was named has disqualified himself morally. Another one's been caught in a moral scandal. An, an additional one has, been, uh, has lost his ministry over mishandling sexual abuse. And one of them is at the end of his career and is no more for what he is against than what he is for in his Christian ministry. See, we are prone to emulate those with ministry effectiveness. But what Paul is calling us here to tonight is to find those who are not modeling ministry effectiveness, but ministry faithfulness. That we should be more concerned about people's faithfulness than their fruitfulness. And that we should seek to be the type of folks who pursue that as well. See, when we compromise our character while pursuing our calling, the danger is it can cultivate cynicism. What is cynicism? It's when you look at the world with a level of skepticism or hostility and disdain. And as cynicism takes root in your heart in the midst of compromising your character on the path to ministry success, you know what can happen? You can begin to hate your mission field, to resist the exact people that God is calling you to serve. And Paul is showing us here in Philippians 3 a different way. And the warning that he is giving to us, especially in this season of life while you are studying for the preparation for the rest of your life at Boyce College, is to beware becoming starving bakers. You ever heard someone talk about the image of a starving baker? Someone who works in a bakery that's so busy feeding others that they fail to feed themselves. That they think that proximity to the product can take the place for intimacy with the, with the product. That in other words, as they feed others, they are failing to nourish themselves. And how can, true can that be for those of us that are familiar with the things of God? that are preparing for ministry in the future. And if we're not character, if we're not careful, the road to ministry success can compromise our character. That's the first warning that Paul gives us this evening from Philippians 3. But notice with me a second warning that he gives us here in verses 18 and 19. He tells us, don't let your success take you where your courage can't keep you. Do you see the way he talks about it in verse 18? For many of whom I have often told you and will now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Paul speaks here of the need for courage in Christian ministry. And I was reminded of that courage not long ago when a friend of mine had the opportunity to host a powerful political figure in his church. If I told you the name of this pastor and the name of this politician, you would immediately recognize them. And before they took the stage together in order for his congregation to pray for this political leader, he had a private moment. He knew he would have a private moment with this man, one-on-one, -on -one, backstage, where he would be able to speak into this person's life for probably the only time he would ever have that contact. And he wrestled with what should I say and how should I say it and right before they took the stage, he leaned over to this political leader, and this is what he said. I want you to understand that you're going to die. None of your money or success will be enough to save you. Right now, you are going to hell. You need to repent and trust Jesus to save you. Can you imagine having the courage to declare that in the big moments of your ministry? Will you know how you get to that level of courage in that position of opportunity? It's by being faithful and demonstrating courage even in the small aspects of your life. And that's precisely what Paul is calling us to through Philippians chapter 3. He is calling us to a life of courage. And what he's showing us is, is that if we are going to maintain courage, 
We need to recognize the reality of our enemies. Do you see the way he talks about it in the verse 18? Walk, he speaks of some who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Every one of us, no matter what your vocation will be in the future, is called to spiritual warfare and ministry. We are called to wage war against those that Paul speaks of here as the enemies of the cross of Christ. There is a reality of an enemy that is working against us, and if we are to stand against it, even in our biggest successes, it requires courage. But if we're going to maintain courage, we also need to recognize the nature of our enemies. Do you see the way he describes them in verse 19? He says their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Now, I know each one of you is on the countdown to Thanksgiving, and not just because you can't wait to get home to enjoy the food, but because you know finals are going to be over, amen? amen. Right? But you're going to go back home once finals wrap up, and you're going to gather around the table for that Thanksgiving meal, and everybody is going to stuff themselves. And I guarantee you, if your house is anything like mine, at the end of that, when people are done eating, someone's going to push back from the table, let out a big sigh, and then declare, I'm so full, I'm never going to eat again. You know what I'm talking about? Because you just can't imagine eating anything else in that moment. You have a satisfied appetite. But you know what happens. Just a few hours later, once the Cowboys game is done and it's the early evening, that same person who said, I can't imagine ever eating again, is the one that's grazing through the kitchen looking for some leftovers. Why is that? It's because the appetites only remain satisfied for a limited time. And when Paul speaks here of these enemies, he describes their nature, that their God is their belly. They are driven by their appetites. They seek to satisfy them just as Adam and Eve did through forbidden fruit. And if we're going to be people of courage in ministry, we need to understand the nature of the enemies that we will encounter. But that's not enough. Paul also shows us here that if we're going to maintain courage, we need to recognize the persistence of our enemies. Do you see the way he describes them? In verse 18, if you look back there, he says, Of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears. In other words, this is not the first time that Paul has warned them about the dangers of the enemies around them. It is a persistent threat that requires a persistent reminder. And if we're going to walk through a lifetime of ministry effectiveness, it's going to require the courage to recognize the persistence of our enemies. See, the danger that each one of us faces is that we may be tempted to compromise our courage for the sake of comfort. That you will move along in ministry, and perhaps even in the early days, you will show great courage to take a stand for gospel truth or to be intentional on gospel mission. But there can come a point in every one of our lives where courage is tempted towards complacency, where conviction can result in compromise. And unless we understand the nature of the enemy that we are called to wage war against, the same can be true of us. Where what success looks like in the future of your ministry is not the comfort of complacency, but the courage of conviction. But I want you to notice a final warning that Paul gives us here in verses 20 and 21. The third warning for ministry success that he provides is this. Don't let your success take you where your community can't keep you. So look back at the way he talks about it in verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And when I was a freshman at Texas a and we got any freshmen in the room tonight? When I was a freshman at A&M during the fall, I loved everything about college life. It was amazing. Uh, the freedom, the fun, even going to class wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. The friendships I was developing were great. But I recognized that there was one gap that I was really missing. And that was a small group of men to invest my life in through Bible study and fellowship. And in the fall of my freshman year, seven guys and me started a Bible study 
during our freshman year that continued all the way on through all the years of our time in college. And when we became sophomores in the fall of 2001, we helped to start a new freshman Bible study for the freshmen that year. And then the year after that, we started another one for freshmen when we were juniors and another one when we were seniors. And here we are. Our, our Bible study began in the fall of 2000. And to this day, there is a brand new freshman Bible study for the, those that started right now in 2019. 20 years of consistent community that came through that small group fellowship. One of the things that we do as a collective of those all-class Bible studies is we try to get together once a year for a spiritual retreat. And this past year when we were together in the Texas Hill Country, one of the exercises that we led that group through is confronting each of them with a question. We handed them a slip of paper that had a phrase on it and then a blank that followed it. And I want you to think about how you might fill in the blank to this statement. Here it is. If someone really knew me, they would know that and then fill in the blank. If someone really knew me, they would know that, fill in the blank. And the whole purpose of the exercise is to recognize the reality that every one of us has things that we often try to hide from others. The things that deep down we don't really want them to know. But unless you know that about us, you can't truly know us. And here's what we found. The four most common answers to that question amongst over 100 men ranging from college freshmen to late 30s, just like me, these were the four most common things they said to the question, if someone really knew me, you would know that. Number one, it said, I have a fear of man. I'm concerned about the way that others perceive me. Number two, I am crippled by anxiety. I have a constant worry about life. There's a fretting, a fear, an anxiety that grips my heart that if somebody really knew me, they would know the way that captivates me. Number three, they would know about the wounds from my childhood. For many of these men, that was at the hands of a father that didn't love them like their heavenly father, that wounded them deeply. They carry scars from their childhood that perhaps some of you, just like them, bear. And the other of the four most common answers is that if somebody really knew me, they would know that I'm addicted to pornography. That even though I can present myself in all the right ways to the Christian community around me, in the quiet and the privacy of my own thought life and my own activity on my phone, they would know that pornography often tempts me into sin. And I wonder this evening, how many of you are facing those same realities? Because what I found is they are universal to many of us. The fear of man, the fear of the future, the, the wounds of a father, the pull towards pornography. Every one of those are community killers. They establish barriers between us and those who could know us with intimacy. And yet here at the end of Philippians 3, Paul is showing us a different way. He is showing us a way rooted in true community. Now, that's the reality. We live in a culture that thrives in the appearance of community. We live in a social media ecosystem that prides itself on how many followers or friends you have how many likes or retweets you get. And it has all the appearance of connection without the intimacy of community. And I wonder how many of you are in that exact situation in your time here at Boyce College. It doesn't get any easier as you head into your professional future, whether that's in the marketplace or ministry. And it's certainly not any easier the greater the level of success that you experience because the greater the success, often the greater the isolation. But Paul shows us a different way. He shows us here in verses 20 and 21 that true community is rooted in our heavenly citizenship. Do you see the way he speaks of it there in verse 20? He said, our citizenship is in heaven. Now I wonder, just by show of hands, how many of you have been on a mission trip before? 
to another country. You know what it's like to go as a representative, as a citizen from one place, to go into another, surrounded by people that are on a common mission with you. It enables you to endure more hardship than you might be able to do in your daily life here because you have a different mindset. You realize that this is not your home, that you are there with the purpose with a common mission that unites you together, in, rooted in your citizenship, not just in the United States, but most importantly, your citizenship in heaven. True community is grounded in our heavenly citizenship. But Paul says here that true community is also rooted in our coming Savior. You see it there in verse 20? He says, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to understand what he means when he uses this word await just think about the way you feel about your finals you're awaiting for that moment when they're over at last where the trials of this semester are behind you where you can experience the lasting freedom for just a couple weeks of not having to study and when he speaks here of awaiting a savior he is speaking of the way that our community should be grounded in a longing for deliverance that can only come from Jesus himself. Because we know the way that the New Testament teaches us that we live in an already but not yet dimension of the kingdom of God where uh, Jesus has already defeated Satan's sin and death through his, his substitutionary death and his victorious resurrection, but yet we don't see all things under his feet. We still experience the brokenness of this world. And in that time period, we are longing for a Savior who is to come. And that should shape the community that we experience. But notice what he says there right after that in verse 21. He tells us how true community is rooted in our powerful king. He says, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. What he's reminding us is that ultimately our king is victorious. That he will restore all things. He will bring all things into subjection. And here's the reality for each one of us tonight. If God has the power to subject all things to himself, then he has the power to sustain us through all the things that we may encounter in ministry. Even the successes that can cultivate isolation and pull us out of community. So the question I hope you're wrestling with right now as we think through this dimension of true community is this. Do you have community around you that will help to sustain you for a lifetime of ministry? One of the best gifts that Southern Seminary ever gave me was not anything I learned in the classroom, but it was three friends who stick closer to me now than a brother. Their names are John and Jed and Ben. I, I will do anything for those guys. They will do anything for me. When I have faced some of the deepest trials of my ministry, they have been the ones to call and encourage me. In fact, just two weeks ago, uh, John sent me a text saying that he had a crisis situation where he was pastoring, and I called him, and the first thing he said to me is, I'm facing the hardest challenge I've ever experienced in ministry. And over the next several days, me and one other guy who he's very close to invested in him, helped him think through things, come up with a plan, figure out how to shepherd his people well, and after just one week passed, you know what happened? He went from telling me on the phone that this is the hardest test my ministry's ever faced to telling me this is the greatest moment I've ever experienced in ministry. Because by God's grace and through true community, God enabled him to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel in that moment. And in order to do that, it means that we must have a commitment to friendship, a commitment to community, just as Paul lays out here in, a, in Philippians chapter 3. Now, I told you at the start of the message tonight the way that the fall of 2002 changed my life. But the year before that, in the fall of 2001, that fall changed everybody's life in America. That was when the World Trade Centers were stuck, struck by terrorists. And I, I wonder, have any of you ever been to New York City before? I, I had, I've had the chance to go numerous times. And one of the last times I was there, I had the opportunity to visit the World Trade Center Memorial. 
And so after those planes were struck by, those towers were struck by the planes, they ended up collapsing. And we know the carnage that happened there. And after they cleared out all the debris, when they were thinking through what is the appropriate way to memorialize this terrible moment in our American history, they began to build a memorial that is primarily underground. When you go there, there's not a whole lot above ground. Most of it is underground, and you can walk through it and experience the stories. You can encounter the heroes. You can be grieved by the brokenness that experienced there. But I'll tell you one thing that still grips me to this day is how deep the museum that was there goes. And the reason that it goes so deep underground is because it exists there at the foundation level of those buildings. Because any architect will tell you that if you want to build something tall, you've got to begin by going deep. In other words, the higher that a piece of construction soars, the deeper the foundation it needs to sustain it. And what's true in architecture is even more true when it comes to ministry. And what I mean by that is this. The greater the heights to which you climb, the deeper the foundation you will need to thrive. And Paul gives us warnings to remind us of the dangers of ministry success. That we must do everything we can to ensure that our success doesn't take us where our character or our courage or our community can't keep us. Let's close in a word of prayer. Fathers, we come to you tonight. I'm praying for each one of these men and women in this room that you would put them on a pathway to ministry faithfulness. Lord, if there is hidden sin in their lives that Satan is cultivating even in the months, in the past, and in the years ahead that he will ultimately use to take them down in the future, I pray that you would show them kindness by exposing it soon. That you would take unrepentant hearts that are willing to give you most of their lives but not all of it, and that you would convict them of sin and deliver them from it. I pray for those that are in isolation here, God, that don't know what it's like to experience the true community that you speak of, Lord. I pray that you would bring them the blessing of friendship that will sustain them through all the highs and lows of ministry. But most of all, Father, we're coming to you now, praying that even in the days that they are here on campus at Boyce College, that you will do whatever it takes to cultivate a dependence on you that will sustain them in the years ahead. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.